If you're thinking about buying a new smartphone gimbal, then make sure to watch this video first. I'm going to talk about what a smartphone gimbal does, why you need one, and I'm going to talk about the differences between all the various smartphone gimbals going from the mini fold-up gimbals all the way up to the bigger hybrid gimbals. I've been using smartphone gimbals for four years. In that time, a whole bunch of different devices have come onto the market. But at the same time, smartphones have better inbuilt stabilization too. So do we really need a smartphone gimbal these days? In this video, I'm going to talk about why I still use smartphone gimbals. And I'm going to talk about how to choose the right gimbal for you. Most gimbals use the same basic modes. So I'll talk about how and when to use them. And I'll talk about how to get the best cinematic shots using a smartphone gimbal. On a very basic level, a smartphone gimbal uses motors to keep your smartphone camera steady when you're moving. This can be really important when using a smartphone to shoot video, as they're more prone than other cameras to handshake. Having a heavier camera actually helps to reduce handshake, simply because you're holding something heavy. But a smartphone is so light, it picks up the tiniest movement from your hands. And if you use a telephoto lens on your smartphone, this problem gets even worse. Motors on a gimbal are constantly working to keep your smartphone shake free. Not only that, but the gimbal itself also adds a bit of extra weight to your camera setup, which also removes some shakiness. The gimbal is able to do this using a combination of sensors and motors, which are able to pinpoint any sudden and unwanted motions and cancel them out. So when we use a smartphone gimbal, what we're hoping for is for it to allow us to create smooth, gracious, cinematic camera movements. Recent flagship smartphones have brilliant inbuilt stabilization. And because of that, some people tell me, you know what, I threw my gimbal out because I don't need it anymore. But here's three reasons why I still use them. One. I use them to get the kind of cinematic shots you just can't get holding the phone in your hands. Those grand sweeping shots they use in movies that we used to need $50,000 worth of kit to get, we can now get with a smartphone and a gimbal. A high crane shot or a drone style shot, for example. In fact, I actually spent a day shooting a video and the idea of the video was to show you how to get all these gimbal style shots, but without using a gimbal because I believed that with the inbuilt stabilization, I could just use a monopod and a smartphone clamp. But most of the shots actually looked pretty horrible, and I ended up abandoning the video. Number two, there's extra features via the gimbal's app, such as motion lapse, vertigo shots, object tracking, and so on. Yes, we can shoot a time lapse with our smartphone on a tripod, but with a gimbal, we can program in a pan as well, which really adds to the cinematic quality. Smartphones come with two types of stabilization, OIS and EIS. OIS stands for optical and uses physical movement of the sensor or lens to remove shakes. EIS, the digital version, uses software instead. This digital stabilization often has a negative effect on the quality of the video. The image is usually cropped, so you're losing pixels. And take this mid-range phone, the Xiaomi 11T, which has pretty poor digital stabilization, and it really does create some nasty artifacts in the video. If you have a phone which only has digital stabilization, like the Xiaomi, I definitely recommend switching it off and using a gimbal instead. If you have a recent iPhone and an app like Filmic Pro, you now have the option to choose these cinematic stabilization modes. And these modes use software to make camera movement very smooth. If you have Filmic Pro, tap the stabilization button and now you get to choose between normal stabilization and these two cinematic modes. When I choose the plus mode, you can see that it crops into the image a little bit. There's also a big delay between your movement and what you see on the screen. And that's because the software needs time to smooth out the handshakes. So yes, you certainly could use inbuilt stabilization and get smooth camera movement. But there are downsides. One, loss of quality. Two, shot choices are more limited. And three, if you use this iPhone cinematic mode, the delay will make the shot a little bit harder to get right. There's so many smartphone gimbals to choose from, 
it can be hard to decide which is the right one for your needs. They range from small fold-up gimbals which can fit in your pocket to larger devices which need a, like a backpack-sized carry case. There's three-axis gimbals as well as two-axis and one-axis gimbals. Some have extendable handles and some come with extras like microphones, fill lights, tripods and so on. As well, gimbals have an accompanying app which adds extra features. But in my experience, these app features are nearly always a little bit more limited on Android devices when compared to the iOS version. So here's my tips for choosing the right gimbal for you. Three axis gimbals have motors which control movement in three different directions, pan, tilt and roll. Pan is left to right, tilt is when the camera looks up at the sky or down at the ground. The roll controls the horizontal tilt of your camera. A one axis gimbal only has a motor on the roll axis. The other two axes are fixed in place. And this kind of gimbal will be useful if you're only going to get shots where you move forward and just want the camera to stay level with the horizon. A two axis gimbal has one motor for the roll axis and another for the pan axis. But the tilt axis is fixed so you can do smooth pan shots and walking forward shots. But if you want to tilt up and down then that's not so easy. The advantage is there's one less motor to go wrong and the gimbal itself is somewhat cheaper. A one axis gimbal is going to be even cheaper still. So if you're on a tight budget and you're happy with less range of shots, you could opt for one of these gimbals which has fewer motors. Personally, for the work I do, I need all three axes. If you're looking for a device which is for more serious video work, then I would choose a three axis gimbal. Now weight is important when it comes to choosing a smartphone gimbal. There's the weight of the gimbal itself and there's the weight that the gimbal can carry. Apart from the weight aspect, there are gimbals which fold up and are therefore easier to carry around. Generally speaking, the foldable gimbals are also lighter. The downside of these gimbals is that they have a lower maximum payload. Meanwhile, other gimbals are sturdier, heavier and less compact. The, the plus side is they can usually carry a heavier payload. If you want to shoot nicer vacation videos or you want a gimbal for vlogging purposes, then a lightweight foldable gimbal like the DJI OM5 could be a perfect choice. Now the question is, do you have a big smartphone? <laughs> or do you want to add accessories to your smartphone? Things like cases, cages, filters, lenses or microphones. If so, then a smaller foldable gimbal might not be a good choice. Because the next question we need to ask is, how much can your gimbal carry? Smartphone gimbals usually have a maximum payload. I looked at dozens of smartphone gimbals and found that the lowest maximum was about 200 grams. Meanwhile, the biggest I could find was the Fiutech G6 Max, which can handle 1.2 kilograms. And the new Dune Crane M3 has no limit at all, because if you can balance the camera, the gimbal can handle it. Well, let's look at the different size gimbals available. For example, DJI says the OM5 can handle a maximum of 230 grams plus or minus 60 grams. That's a bit of a vague number, but we can at least say the absolute maximum is 230 plus 60, which is 290 grams. As an example, the iPhone 13 Pro Max weighs 238 grams just on its own. That means one of the big flagship smartphones is going to take up nearly all that motor power before you even think about adding extras. One thing to remember is that these max payload numbers are really just a guide. The gimbal isn't going to explode just because you go over that number, but it does give you a rough idea. With the DJI OM5, you could choose to go over that 290 gram maximum and the gimbal will still work. But if you do, getting the phone balanced well on the gimbal becomes a bit more important. As well, be aware by going over the recommended limit, you might be using the battery quicker, as well as wearing the motors out a bit faster. Another problem you might encounter is accessories restricting the movement of the gimbal. So in this range of gimbals, you have devices such as the Hoem iSteady X2, the Moza Mini MX, and the Dune Smooth Q3. 
If you're more serious about shooting video with your smartphone and want the option to add accessories to the smartphones, then my favorite is the Dune Smooth 5. The max payload is 300 grams, but I've gone higher than that without too much problem. Again, balancing your smartphone is really the key. This gimbal has the advantage of a regular smartphone gimbal because it's pretty easy to mount a smartphone and get shooting. A comparable gimbal might be the Dune Crane M2, which is what's known as a hybrid gimbal. But personally, I found this gimbal to be a bit tricky to get the smartphone mounted and balanced correctly. One downside of the Smooth 5 is that the phone presses against the motor at the side, and this blocks the port where you might want to connect a mic. But personally, I record audio separately anyway, so this isn't an issue for me. Some gimbals are designed to be used with both regular cameras and smartphones, as well as devices like action cameras. And these gimbals tend to be bigger and bulkier, with stronger motors and a little bit slower to mount. As well, they are generally going to be more expensive. That said, I really enjoy using the Dune Crane M3. It folds up quite small, but is still able to carry quite heavy cameras. There's also hybrids like the Moza Mini P, which can carry up to 900 grams, and the Fiutech G6 Plus, which can carry 800 grams. One strategy we can use to help balance an accessory-laden gimbal is to use counterweights. And one problem with balancing smartphone gimbals, where the camera is tends to be heavier than the bottom. To help solve this problem, some gimbals allow you to add counterweights. So for example, the DJI OM range of gimbals, like the OM3, OM4 and 5, have a place especially to mount counterweights. So you can use these to counterbalance the camera, especially if you're gonna add lenses and filters to that end as well. Although they might have slightly different names, all smartphone gimbals operate using basically the same modes. <laughs> In a three-axis gimbal, there are three modes which are central to how a smartphone gimbal works. And these three modes each change how the gimbal's motors work. But simply, a gimbal motor is either following your movement or it's not following your movement. When you switch modes, you're telling one or more of the motors to switch from following to not following, or vice versa. So just to clarify, a motor which we call locked is one which doesn't follow your movement and unlocked is one that does. When all three motors are unlocked, the gimbal motors follow your movements in all directions. This mode might be called FPV, which is first person view, or POV, point of view mode. When two motors are unlocked, the gimbal will follow your movements on the pan and tilt axes. And this mode is often called follow mode. Now, when one motor is unlocked, the gimbal will follow only pan movements. And this is usually called tilt locked mode or pan follow mode. So that's how the three basic modes work. But when and how should we use them? Different gimbals access modes in different ways. The DJI OM3, 4 and 5 gimbals need to use the MIMO app to access the modes. While the Zune gimbals, like the Smooth 4 or 5, have a dedicated mode button and a mode indicator on the handle to show you which mode you're in. This makes the Jiun gimbals and other gimbals with a similar design easier to use without the app. The thing is, you are likely to get better quality video with your smartphone's native camera app. And that is especially the case if you have an Android device. If you can change modes with just the button on the handle, using your native camera is gonna be easier. Okay, let's start with the most natural mode which is a mode called follow. And by natural, I mean this mode views the world in a similar way to people. Follow mode follows our pan left and pan right movements, as well as our tilt up and tilt down movements. And we're actually used to seeing the world this way, because during a normal day, we're gonna mostly look left and right or up and down. And so that's why most of the time I have my gimbal set to follow mode. FPV or POV mode is almost the same as follow mode, except now the gimbal follows your roll movements as well. 
you can think of roll movements as rolling your wrist, which makes the camera move at an angle to the horizon. And this is not how we normally see the world. Unless we're sailors on a ship in a rough sea, we're not likely to view the world at such an angle. And therefore, this mode allows us to get more creative with our shots. Rolling our wrist as we push in on a subject is kind of more fun than just a simple push in. And this mode is great for creating exciting B-roll shots for an upbeat montage. <laughs> When only one motor follows your movement, this is called tilt locked or pan follow mode. And this means the gimbal will only follow your left and right pan movements. This mode is useful for shots tracking a subject, and that includes filming yourself. When you're tracking someone, you usually want the camera to stay on the subject. You don't want it tilting up and down, especially if they're talking to camera. Okay, so that's the three basic smartphone gimbal modes covered. And now you should have a good understanding of how this device works to keep your footage looking smooth and cinematic. But that's one thing a gimbal is not good at dealing with, and that is footsteps. In a way, a smartphone gimbal does a similar job to a device used in the film industry called a Steadicam. You may have seen camera operators running around filming sports events with one of these strapped to them. And no matter how fast they run, the footage seems to come out perfectly smooth. However, if we try the same thing with a smartphone gimbal, we're likely to get this up and down movement appearing. And that's because unfortunately, every time we take a footstep, our body naturally moves up and down slightly. So what can we do? Well, here's five ways to remove or reduce the footstep problem. One option is to do what Oscar-winning director Steven Soderbergh did when he made his first smartphone shot movie, Unsane. He used a DJI gimbal, but to film tracking shots, he sat himself in a wheelchair. Then he had a member of the crew push him around. This worked because he could afford a film crew. And plus he was filming in a disused building with nice smooth floors. The smartphone gimbal operator's ninja walk has become a well-known method for reducing the bobbing motion. This technique involves keeping your knees bent and moving slowly in a kind of half crouch, as if you're creeping up on someone perhaps. And clearly, the slower and more cautiously you move, the less bobbing movements there will be. And also, taking smaller footsteps is going to reduce the up and down movement. The problem with this technique comes when you want to walk briskly or even run. Now, if you tilt the handle slightly forward, your wrists and arms absorb some of the up and down movement. This way, you create a fourth axis with your wrists. The thing is, a professional Steadicam uses this fourth axis to keep the camera kind of floating above the ground. When you hold the gimbal handle straight, there's no fourth axis. But if you have it at an angle, the arm of the gimbal becomes a kind of shock absorbing spring. So this might seem counterintuitive, but as I mentioned earlier, a heavier gimbal will be less affected by the movement of your steps. Remember, your shoulders, elbows and wrists are all extra axis points. By adding weight, they sort of come into play more. So just think about two people carrying a piano between them. The piano isn't going to be shaking around too much. And so adding weight turns your body into a more effective shock absorber. And this could be another use for your monopod, for example. And the final tip is to use software. Because, for example, all the main editing programs like Adobe Premiere, Final Cut, LumaFusion and DaVinci Resolve have video stabilization inbuilt that you can add to your video clips. And earlier, I talked about smartphones using software for stabilization. And this is basically the same thing, except you're applying it to the video after it's been shot. The advantage of using this kind of software over your phone's software is that you can really fine tune the settings. But like when you enable it on your phone, this can do nasty things to your video as well. So my advice is to apply it in small amounts and see if it helps to reduce the up and down movement. So let's move on and look at more advanced gimbal modes. When you don't want the gimbal to follow any movements, this mode is usually called locked or maybe lock mode. 
Use this mode when you just want the gimbal to keep your camera stable and pointing in one direction. So for example, if you're moving around but you don't want the camera to pan, tilt or roll. So one use of this is when you want to have the camera fly over an object or a surface while you move around it. This mode works a bit differently on different gimbals. So for example, on the OM3, 4 and 5 gimbals, you need to hold the trigger down to enter locked mode. When you release the trigger, the gimbal returns to the previous mode. On the other hand, the Jiun gimbals usually allow you to switch to lock mode just using the normal mode selector. And this means with the Zhiyun, you don't need to keep holding down the trigger, which can be an advantage if you want to use this mode for long periods or to get shots where you are not able to hold down the trigger. For example, where you have the gimbal mounted to an extension pole. So this is a mode that allows the smartphone to rotate around the center. And essentially, this is similar to rolling our wrists in FPV or POV mode, except we can spin further and perhaps smoother. Using a gimbal like the DJI OM5, select spin shot mode using the MIMO app selector. And now push the control stick left or right and your smartphone will start to spin. With a gimbal like the Smooth 5, once you select vortex mode, the gimbal changes the position of the smartphone. So now you need to hold the handle like a flashlight. So again, you can use this mode to create fun B-roll shots and some cool editing effects. For example, if you cut from one spin shot to another, you can create a really interesting transition. Another mode which is common to most smartphone gimbals is called Sport or maybe Go mode. In this mode, the gimbal will react faster to your movements. Like if you're filming sports, for example. So personally, I probably just use handheld shots to get these kind of rapid movements. But I guess it does save you time mounting and dismounting the smartphone from the gimbal. Using a DJI OM gimbal, you can switch to sport mode in the MIMO app or double tap and hold the trigger. With the Smooth 5, you just press and then hold the trigger. Releasing the trigger will quit go mode. So now that we've covered the modes, let's look at something that you should probably do before you use your smartphone gimbal. Most smartphone gimbals allow you to put them through a calibration process. And this process analyzes the position of your phone in relation to the horizon. And the aim is to make sure your smartphone camera is perfectly level. So if you find your smartphone looks a little bit off for some reason, just quickly put it through the calibration process. It usually only takes a few seconds. And if it still doesn't look right, the app which comes with the gimbal might allow you to adjust the level manually. Personally, I find being able to adjust the gimbal level manually is really useful. The Jiun Crane M3 even allows you to assign this control wheel at the front of the gimbal handle to adjust the level. And this is one feature I really love about this gimbal because you can quickly and instinctively set the level how you want it. So let's quickly talk about orientation. For people who are shooting video for social media, it can be useful to switch the orientation of the smartphone. By orientation, I mean from landscape to portrait and vice versa. Switching orientation is much easier using the DJI OM gimbals compared to the Smooth 5, for example. The DJI OM5 even has a button just for this purpose. But with the Smooth 5, you have to dismount the phone and remount it again every time you want to switch. So if switching orientation is something you're likely to do often, the Smooth 5 might not be the gimbal for you. I found that you can simply turn the handle 90 degrees to go from landscape to portrait. That said, you probably wouldn't want to hold the gimbal like that for too long. So apart from using the modes, there are other creative ways to use a smartphone gimbal. So let's talk about using a gimbal with a tripod. Most, if not all, smartphone gimbals have a screw hole at the bottom which is compatible with all regular tripods. So if you want, you can mount your gimbal onto a tripod. And this can be a good idea if your gimbal app has an object tracking feature and you want to use it to film yourself. This then allows you to move around and the gimbal should track your movement. It's like having your own personal robot camera operator. Apart from a regular sized tripod, it's really useful to have a mini tripod. 
Most gimbals, like the DJI OM5 and the Smooth 5, come with these mini tripods included, and if your gimbal doesn't, I recommend you get one. You can get them pretty cheaply online, so I'll leave some links in the description for that. It's because most of the time, I just leave the mini tripod attached while I'm using the gimbal. Just fold up the legs and use it as a handle extension. And when I finish the shot, I can just quickly pull out the tripod legs and then rest the gimbal on a table somewhere while I work out the next shot. As well, you can use this mini tripod for getting time lapse or motion lapse shots. Place it on a table, for example, program in the shot and set it running. And as well, you can use this for filming yourself with the object tracking, just like with a regular tripod. One of my favorite shots with a smartphone gimbal is a high shot swooping down. On a movie set, they will use a big camera crane and a trained crew, which costs lots of dollars. But with a smartphone, a gimbal and a monopod, you can achieve this shot pretty easily. There are even extension rods designed to be used specifically for gimbals, but I prefer to use a monopod because I actually use it for other shots as well. For example, a dolly left or right is a very common cinematic shot in movies. But if you do this with just a handheld smartphone gimbal, it's quite hard to get a smooth motion left to right. Your hands are gonna move up and down. But if I add a monopod, I can rest the foot on the floor and now move slowly left to right. And the gimbal will keep the smartphone level with the horizon. So now you get a much smoother dolly shot. You can also use the monopod for creative uses. For example, have your smartphone camera flying across the surface of water. This can be a really cool cinematic looking shot. And there's a bunch of other shots you can get with a monopod too, especially if you're filming solo like I often am and you want to put yourself in the video. So I just got a question for you. What are the most boring videos to watch? No, not smartphone gimbal tutorials. No, let me tell you. And the answer is videos with no subject. Nice landscapes and buildings are fine, but what really makes the difference between a beginner and a professional is sometimes as simple as having a subject within the frame. It doesn't necessarily have to be a person, it can be a building, for example. So except for wide angle establishing shots, my tip is to try to find a subject for every shot. It can be a flag, a window, a pet, a flower, basically anything that you find interesting. But let's say we want to film a b-roll sequence and we would really like to have someone in some of the shots. Once you add a person into the sequence, it does make it more interesting for the audience and it also creates an essential human connection to your sequence and makes it more like a story. Problem is, as a solo filmmaker, filming ourselves can be a challenge. And that's where the smartphone gimbal and monopod come in. If you have a gimbal with an extendable handle like the DJI OM5, you don't even need a monopod. So using an extended handle, you can hold the camera further away. And if you do it right, it can even look like someone else is filming you. My advice is to mix your shots and angles. For example, say a standard close up, followed by a low shot looking up, but maybe a bit wider, followed by a shot of your feet maybe. How about an overhead shot looking down? Another option is, as I mentioned before, to set the gimbal down on a tripod and use the object tracking functions. And of course, you can add these shots to the previous shots I just mentioned. Now, before you buy a smartphone gimbal, you should be aware of this problem, which I guess we can call the Android problem. As we know, smartphone gimbals usually come with an accompanying app, which adds a bunch of extra features. So in the last four years, I've tested quite a few apps and one thing they generally have in common is the Android version of the app is somewhat less good than the iPhone version. In my experience, the apps are less reliable on Android. Features are missing and the frame rates produced are pretty hit and miss and resulting in video which isn't as smooth as it should be. And since the Android 12 update, it seems this situation has become even worse. But not just for gimbal apps even but actually for most third-party camera apps. Of all the smartphone gimbal apps, I believe the Mimo app is probably the best. For iOS, it works very well, but for Android devices, there is no manual control and there's less options for resolution and frame rate. In fact, DJI doesn't even list the app on Google Play Store anymore. 
So if you want the Mimo app for your Android, currently you need to download it from the DJI website and install it within your smartphone. And this might mean bypassing security measures on your phone, which usually stop you installing apps this way. On the plus side, Zune have recently released an app called StarCam. The app is a bit like Filmic Pro, giving you all kinds of features, including manual control, as well as support for Zune gimbals. For example, the StarCam app lets you use the Smooth 5 focus wheel to control focus, allowing you to use the wheel as a kind of follow focus. And this is really useful as it adds a very common shot used by pro filmmakers called the focus pull. So here's another question. Are the smartphone gimbal apps even that important? So people who just want to use their gimbal as like a mini steady cam quite often don't use the app which comes with it. Rather, they will use the native app of the smartphone. However, the apps do add some popular features. For example, the three lapses, time lapse, motion lapse and hyperlapse. All these features are used to compress time. Basically, the camera shoots at a very slow frame rate and then plays back much faster. Time-lapse shots are used in all kinds of shows and movies, and if you do it right, they can look awesome. A basic time-lapse uses a stationary camera, and as our smartphone native camera apps now come with their own time-lapse modes, there's really no need to use a gimbal for this shot. Hyperlapse is like a time-lapse, except the camera is moving. Again, you could probably shoot this pretty well holding the smartphone in your hands. However, the gimbal does give you some advantage, creating a smoother shot and allowing you to use object tracking to focus on a particular subject in the frame. Motion lapse is the one where you really do need a gimbal. A motion lapse is where the camera pans or moves in some way during the shot, and there's no easier way to do this than by using a gimbal. The gimbal moves the camera steadily, so the motion should be nice and smooth. Smartphone gimbal apps often allow such shots as the Vertigo shot. In the Mimo app, this is called the DynaZoom. Other apps have their own name for it, probably. And this allows you to create an effect where the background appears to expand or contract. And if you get it right, it can look pretty effective. Another mode allows you to take photos with multiple versions of yourself within the same picture. There's things like DJI Mimo Story Mode, which allows you to quickly create B-roll sequences to music. And there's Jiwon's ZY Kami app, which has a similar feature as well. There's quite a number of videos on YouTube which give you like 10 shots or five shots or the eight best shots to do this and that. But my latest guide for members on Patreon tells you how to create your own shots using a smartphone gimbal. So once you understand the basic principles of shot creation, you can make shots anywhere, anytime, with any subject. You can use these techniques anywhere. I've also got a bunch of other downloads. There's my 170 page guide to smartphone filmmaking, as well as a guide on color grading. There's a deep dive into the film look and all kinds of other smartphone filmmaking knowledge that I'm adding to week after week to build up a really big, strong library so that you can master the techniques and become a professional smartphone filmmaker yourself. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video.